My name is Todd Sevig, and I am Director of uh, Counseling and Psychological Services here on campus, which is our, the name for our Student Counseling Center. And on behalf of my co-chairs, Dr. John Graydon and Dr. Daniel Eisenberg, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you, me, all of us, to the 17th Annual Depression on College Campuses Conference. Um, the, uh, maybe it's a sign of old age, I'm not sure, but I find myself thinking back uh, years ago, history, when the seeds of this effort started, and uh, it was around 18, maybe 19 years ago, when the vision of uh, John Graydon uh, started to promote this idea of what if we got people together on all of our campuses to think about student mental health, to think about depression, um, rates of suicide, prevention, what can we all do as a university uh, campus, as a college campus. And there was a small group of us, we were just mentioning, there was a small group of us that met in the Michigan Union, and from there, with John's vision and leadership, really took off, and you all, some of you literally in the room, and um, some of you, I assume, this is the first time you've attended this conference, uh, but over the years, people have said it's meaningful, and we get a lot out of it, and we want to keep coming, and here we are 17 years later. Um, you know, our invitation to you, in addition to welcoming you to Ann Arbor, to the University of Michigan, our invitation is to use the specialness, the uniqueness of this conference to inform all of us in our different roles. So the uniqueness is this that this conference has had a few guiding lights, but one of them has been to use all the different roles that we have on campus for the betterment of mental health in general with a focus on students. And to our knowledge, this is the only gathering conference in the country that intentionally focuses on that. So some of us are faculty, some of us are students, some of us are academic advisors, uh, staff in the university, staff in the counseling center, staff, staff in the health center, uh, medical campus, departments of, of psychiatry for us and for some of you. But let's use all those different roles and perspectives that we have to our advantage in this next day and a half. So on breaks, when you're in a program, hear the questions, hear the conversations, offer your own perspective. It's a really unique experience. And so that's our invitation to you, along with the welcome. You know, it, it's our job, I think, to uh, make the invitation, to set the table uh, as hosts. And we have a planning committee, which uh, I encourage you to look at in the booklet there. Um, you know, a group that meets literally throughout the year to think about, OK, what can we do to help all of us? We look at the feedback that you provide, and we come up with this, this table, if you will, for a day and a half, um, and we try to be good hosts. But the magic is really up to all of us to participate in the dinner, in the feast, in the buffet, um, as we go through this next day and a half together. Um, in addition to uh, the three of us as co-chairs and the planning committee, uh, Stephanie Salazar is the one person that provides the glue to make this whole conference happen. Uh, I can't actually see if she's in the room or not, but uh, when you see her, please tell her thank you and the staff that works with her. So enjoy the next day and a half um, as we go forward. So transitioning a little bit, it's also my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker today, uh, Dr. Peter Cornish. Uh, Peter is a colleague of mine in terms of the uh, National and International Directors Group, um, and I've heard him present uh, quite a few times, and he is one of the innovators of an approach, a model, a mindset, a heart set for healthcare organizations, including counseling centers, um, that, you know, time will tell, so to speak 
but it's, it's something that is, and this is a little dramatic for someone who's from northern Minnesota, but I'll say it anyway, uh, I think it has the potential to revolutionize what we're doing in providing services for students on all of our colleges and universities and all of our campuses. So when we were talking as a planning committee, uh, we thought this really fits the theme that we had identified that you see on the screen and in your program booklet where one size does not fit all. Let, let's listen to the people who need the help in terms of what helps them. So Peter uh, is an associate professor and served as the director of the Student Wellness and Counseling Center at Memorial University of Newfoundland from 2003 until August of this year. The center that he directed is an academic and service unit with a focus on interprofessional wellness programming, training, and research. Uh, the programming includes primary medical care, psychiatric consultation, counseling, and a wide range of other mental health supports, healthy campus development activities, academic teaching and training in the faculties of medicine and science. Uh, Dr. Cornish's clinical and research interests include online mental health, stepped care programming, which is what he'll be focusing on today for us, mental health service innovations, change management, interprofessional team functioning, and group dynamics. He's currently on sabbatical this year, writing about the topic today, and he's gone really deep and has shared with the rest of the country um, to inform us, and we're very happy to have him here with us today. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Peter Cornish. Thank you, Todd, for such a, a wonderful um, introduction. Yes, so the revolution begins now. And, uh, but I just want to tell you a little story. Uh, speaking of revolution, um, I almost didn't get here. Uh, and, uh, and I'm going to take you through the list of uh, all the things that went wrong. And so as you're listening to my list of things that went wrong on my attempt to come into um, this wonderful country and this beautiful space, um, I want you to think about what we often ask our students to do when they uh, come into waiting rooms at uh, college and university uh, campuses. So we often ask them to list all the things that went wrong or are wrong with them, go through symptom checklists pretty much. Uh, we rarely ask them anything about what's right. So just bear with me while I go through, um, and I'm actually delighted that these things happened because it, um, it, it allowed me to reflect on the wisdom that I've developed over, over the years in how to embrace um, challenges. So um, started with, I was in St. Catharines, Ontario yesterday, which is right near Niagara Falls. Um, left my charger in the... Um, a hotel room. Then um, I'm on the plane going through my bag and there's two sets of keys in there. One belongs to the rental car I just dropped off. That's not good. Somebody's not going to be happy about that. Um, and uh, before I got on the plane though, um, I had to go through customs. That's the way it works in, in, in Canada. You go through US customs first. I knew I was on the watch list because uh, they denied me entry to go to Washington in August because um, I didn't have the right invitation letter that, uh, to go to uh, Jillian Berry's uh, shop to, to do a little bit of training. Um, and they gave me an instruction sheet for next time, what I have to bring in order to go and get a, sm a, a small payment. Uh, so I, feel, I did all that and I presented and they said, no, that's not the right sheet, that doesn't work for this. Um, so I'm afraid because the, in your letter from Michigan they've offered you a little bit of money, uh, we have to deny you access because you're not um, approved to work in the United States. So that was after four hours of waiting. I missed my flight. Uh, they brought my bag back. And then the other thing that went wrong was my bag, um, uh, because they pulled it off. When they pulled it off the plane, they broke it. So then they had to put everything in a plastic bag. At, at, the, at the last minute, just before they were about to escort me out, I said, can I show you this letter again from the University of Michigan? So I'm a keynote speaker, uh, two days. And I don't know how many we have here, but I said, I said 500 uh, people. 
Um, so there are going to be 500 disappointed Americans if you don't let me into the country. And I, I, I thought, that's not going to work. You can't argue with these people at the customs agent. And she, she thought, and then she said, okay, I'll let you in this time. But she circled on the paper the money. She said, you can't do this again. And I'm thinking... This doesn't make sense, because, I mean, you, you have to bring in worldwide speakers, and they're not going to come here for nothing. So anyway, so I, let's not go down that road. Um, so you, you've heard all, the, all the, um, uh, the list. It was 10 to midnight when I got in, and then, damn it, if I didn't lock the key in the door when I took, in my room when I took the card out. So then I had to go down and get a key. And then they said, there's a bar right over there. I went to the bar. I, had, I don't drink normally. I had a drink. And I decided that after midnight, it's a new day and everything's gonna be fine. But on the way, there were so many stories that were fascinating in the waiting room uh, in detention. So what I decided was um, I, was gonna, I, I was going to connect. And, I, and if you've ever been in one of these rooms, everybody's nervous, nobody talks, they don't let you use your cell phone. So guess what, you actually have to talk because they don't let you use your cell phone or computer. And I decided to talk to this perfect stranger. And we were laughing by the end. And he was giving me a high five. And he was doing this when I got through, which you, I don't think you're really supposed to do in that environment. <laughs> but what I started to do was have some fun. And it's a really hard place to have fun. And it's really hard when you're depressed to have fun. When I um, uh, supervise graduate students, I'm really surprised sometimes that, uh, that they have um, never been asked that question by their supervisor, are you having fun? because this is serious work. And I think sometimes we fail to do that with people with serious mental illnesses. And so this is uh, part of how we're revolutionizing is we're shifting the risk paradigm to start um, beginning with successes, beginning with the uh, assumption that people are, are all have capabilities. And so the recovery model, which you might be familiar with, uh, APA has, has uh, put out a report or a, a I guess a definition in 2012 of, of, of what recovery principles are. We have not embedded those in our service models. So that's part of what I'm, I'm going to share with you. But today, this isn't really as much of a talk where I'm going to, um, you're going to walk away with your brains full. Um, this is an invitation to start um, thinking about this and continuing the dialogue with me. So this thing that I'm going to show you, if I remember how to do it. So this is a PowerPoint. Um, but I call it an interactive PowerPoint because it's uh, not going to go slide by slide. You can click on these buttons and you can go and look for what you want. And this is a, a growing uh, resource. It's a, it's a repository. So every time I connect with some folks uh, like yourselves, um, of course, you have brilliant ideas and you have, you have amazing objections. And sometimes I offend. And then what I say is when I offend, come on, let's come on in and uh, help me to build it better. When, so there's, nev there's never a complaint that isn't an opportunity for improvement. And, and that sort of failing forward is a theme that cuts through this. So I believe I failed forward last night. And the stories I heard from the taxi drivers were amazing. So I told a little bit of my story. Just a little bit. But then they were so eager to tell their story. So the first one was a retired, high-ranking police officer uh, who's now Ubering, who was injured. Um, and he said, I have to keep myself busy. I got the package. I'm, I was paid um, because I knew I would get depressed if I didn't. And, um, and I said, well, well, what is it about this that is um, working for you? And he said, I love the stories. When I'm, I love the connecting. Um, and he was telling his story, and it's quite a story. I won't go into the details. And then, damn it, if the same thing didn't happen today when I had to go buy the, the charger at Best Buy and take a cab out. And it turns out the, com the president of the cab company arrived. And man, did he have war stories, I mean, literally war stories. And I, I, all I did was I said, oh, I had a little bit about my trouble. And then, and then he, that was his invitation to tell me his story. And some of the wisdom that came out of that is exactly what we're trying to do. Um, and we always ask our clients to tell the stories. But we were taught not really to tell our own stories that much uh, because that's a boundary crossing. And, and so some of that needs to be um, uh, fiddled around with a bit. But I digress. I want to show you uh, something under the risk paradigm right here. And the reason this is relevant and I have no relation to this author, this journalist. I don't, how many of you have seen this book, Lost Connections? Oh, I saw a really eager hand up there. But does that mean you like it? <laughs> okay. What did you like? 
Shout it out. I put you on the spot. Meaning, meaning. So lost connection, so, so a social model of connections. So the thesis of this book, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's by a journalist and they're out there to poke, poke uh, at us, right? And, and so it's a big attack on uh, big pharma and, and medication. And I, you know, I, I like attacks because it allows us to think. It doesn't mean that we have to throw everything out. But um, it, what, it, it, what it, it encourages us to do is to, is to identify, not, I guess in, in contrast to the, some of the messaging from Big Pharma, that it is a biochemical disease, um, to ask the question, are there some meaningful explanations, even though when they appear not to be? And so what, do we, what, is, what does this author mean by lost connections? It's not just people. It's connection to purpose and meaning. And in college and counseling, uh, college and university counseling centers, that's, that was our birthplace, was uh, in alignment with the academic mission to find purpose and meaning to go forward in your life and make a difference in the world. We've shifted to treatment centers that focus on the elimination of deficits, which is what medication does. Medication is not going to give you purpose and meaning. A lot of it's placebo, so it has a bit of this hope thing, and it, so it's, it's giving you hope, but it's not giving you meaning. And so meaning is, is, is huge. And so we really want to preserve that as we um, build a system that, that, that um, meaning is there. And one way that we do that is we don't admit people to service based on the severity of their concerns. Much more important is your readiness to do something. And my argument is, my thesis is, everybody is ready to do something. And if we base our assessments and our, our treatments on how severe they are, it can distract us from discovering what is the person that we're encountering now ready to do. Uh, so if it's somebody with a severe illness, it might be hard to figure out what they're ready to do. Maybe they're ready to take medication. Okay, we'll go that route. But let's ask them first about some of their capacities, because that's the window into what people are, feel passionate about, and what you feel passionate about is what you might be ready to do. Okay, let me just take a quick look at my my notes. I have I have this. I feel sometimes like I'm like a police detective these days. I love this little this little pad. I, I make my notes on it because I use technology all the time. But you know, you just can't beat uh, a little notepad like this as an adjunct to the technology. Okay, so um, the risk paradigm. Let's go into that a little bit. So, what do we mean by that? And this ties into the Lost Connections thesis. And if, has anybody seen this book on policy, Beyond the Risk Paradigm in Mental Health Policy and Practice? No, okay. Um, for those of you who are interested in that sort of high level, it's, it's, an, it's an easy read. It, it's probably worth your while. Um, and I've taken a, a, a quote from this. Uh, Corporate-oriented risk management strategy is overly focused on the possibility of danger, obscure the value um, of risk-taking activities. And um, so everything we do has, has risks in it. And, 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 and when we have failures, those uh, often um, our conclusion is, I took, I made a mistake and this is bad. As opposed to, is it somehow an opportunity for something amazing to happen? So uh, I took a risk in arriving at the airport a bit too late. Um, I took a risk of, Telling the truth, because that's um, what I when I talk to folks that invite speakers now, they, they say the only way you can get in to the U.S. is to lie. So I took a risk to tell the truth, and it failed. And but but it, but I got something rich out of it in the end, and it helps me with what I'm doing right here, standing in front of you. Um, so it sets the stage for narrow and defensive practice. So if there's a, if we miss something, there will be a suicide. I hate to tell you. But what you do in your first encounter with people has very little um, relationship to whether they are going to die or live. Now, risk assessment can get people to treatment, but at a cost. And uh, the cost is, if we're going to be sitting around paying all our time, all our, giving all our attention trying to see who is the next risk person, we make people nervous. Just like I get a bit nervous walking into the customs office because they're looking to see who is going to be the threat. And I have to, I have to um, try and be honest and not nervous because otherwise I'm a risk or a threat. 
as opposed to, imagine this, in the, in the customs office, the, instead of looking to see who's a threat, you look to see what's good about a person. I bet you if I'd started with my story about what I'm going to do with some enthusiasm, you know, the customs agent in the end was telling me she studied psychology and depression. They're not allowed to talk to people, but in the end they were talking. I should have done that to begin with. I should have struck up a conversation. The problem with that is they don't really encourage that. Anyway, again, I, I, again, I digress a little bit. So we, we, um, we have narrow practices if we're basing our decisions on fear instead of what might go right. Um, there's a lot of detail in this PowerPoint that you will be able to access at, at that website, StepCare 2.0. Uh, if you wanted to dig, dig deeper and, and see um, you know, where, what I'm basing some of these conclusions on. But I'll give you, um, I'll give you a glimpse. Uh, okay. First of all, I want to show you this. So this um, triangle, um, some people use this to arrange their steps. And what you see in the blue zone are um, universal population-based programs. So uh, those can be intentional or they can just be some things that are naturally in the environment. It's some beautiful buildings on campus, some trees, some big high windows. Um, these are some things that are in, in, we can invest in that um, probably have a higher impact on mental health than we acknowledge and because we're not monitoring um, those investments. Uh, then in investing in peer support programs probably are going to have, I hate to say it, and I'll show you why I can conclude this, a bigger impact than what we as professionals do, especially if we're devoting all of our attention to the people in that high-risk zone. Um, to try and um, make sure they don't do anything wrong. Or um, I think we've deluded ourselves that pu putting all that attention to them in the way that we do actually makes things better. An example um, about uh, doing it wrong when you're investing resources, including whole campus resources in risk. I'll tell you a story about Memorial University. So in 2014, 2015, I think it was either that or the 2015, 2016, there were two suicides. And the two suicides were in the uh, west tower of a fairly new residence building on the fifth floor, one year apart, the same week of March, coming up next week. Last year was the first year, I, I guess now we can figure out when it was, um, where there wasn't a suicide. Whew. Yeah, so contagion uh, possibility there. But what was interesting um, in, that we discovered in the, in the uh, uh, postvention process and even during yeah, the postvention process um, and following postvention where I had this brilliant idea that I'm gonna shift the risk paradigm by instead of uh, we're just gonna teach all these resident student, uh, student life people to detect the next suicide, um, I'm actually going to give them some resources to, to help them. Because what they'd all been trained in is the kinds of things, assist, all kinds of things that everybody uses. In, in Canada, the Mental Health Commission of Canada has a mental health first aid program that's two days. They get all that. They get all kinds of things. The mental, I, I actually have a close relationship with the Mental Health Commission, uh, especially on this particular model, but I'm trying to get in the door with the people that are doing the mental health first aid training. Because they pay lip service to support, the first thing you're supposed to do is listen, but what everybody you train on mental health first aid hears is um, get anxious and refer and pass the hot potato. Um, and so these, so think about it. these poor students, what they learned in this residence, both of these towers, the whole residence system, was um, inadvertently they learned that they are the only ones that are gonna prevent the next death. These are young kids, they're supposed to be having some fun, and now they're, uh, and so the, we took that out a long time ago, because in Canada, the drinking age is lowered, and so we thought, oh, there's too much drinking going on in residence. That's bad. Risk managers told us that's a, that's a recipe for disaster, and we know that it is sexual assault. We know there are dangers there. But this whole they ripped it out, and then, of course, drinking still happened. It just, it just went underground and went off campus down to... Anyone been to St. John's, Newfoundland? Okay, one person. Did you go to George Street? You, you may, if you went to St. John's, you went to George Street. It's just a, a street of bars, and, and it's Irish culture and big, big drinking culture. So lots of bad things happen, um, but we didn't solve it by saying you shouldn't have fun here and drink in this residence. So the residence became a climate of fear and anxiety and somehow this myth that we are going to prevent deaths. And what we took out was kindness and connections and meaning and purpose and identity. 
and there were cold places. So investment, both, I argue, in um, providing a care that's focused solely on level of pathology, um, and including that we will, we will reinforce people for being in crisis because that's how we see you quickly, then um, guess what? We're, we're perpetuating a problem, both in our prevention work and in our, in our response and our treatment work. We're saying you get treatment if you're really sick. And uh, what we found, and we've done this across the province in our publicly funded system, is that everyone in the province can get immediate access to care by phone, by text, or walk-in. And single session approaches prevail. Now, single session is a misnomer. Mosh Tolman and Michael Hoyt have uh, been interviewed, and uh, journalists asked, why did you call it that? And he said, well, my publisher made me do it, because they, they really wanted to call it uh, one session at, a session at a time. It's like going to your GP. Why don't we do that in mental health? That, you know, you can get in pretty quickly, and there's no assumption that you're going to get follow-up. Now, you could have psychotherapy for 16 weeks if that is deemed to be something you want and there's a good connection. But the default is, come on in, and we'll see if we can produce something today that will be useful to you. So solution-focused narrative approaches kind of drive that first contact. And any of you that know anything about solution and, and narrative approaches, uh, they, are, um, they don't ask about deficits. They will ask about risk and suicide, but they just assume and they trust that people are mostly well. And you know, thanks to Freud and lots of other people, we assume that we just can't trust our clients because the unconscious is so big and we have to dig down and we have to turn over every stone before we feel comfortable and, and think that we're not gonna get sued. Instead, if we say, guess what? Um, I trust you and I'm giving you lots of access and I can't possibly know everything about you in this first encounter, but you know our system is based on failing forward. We, we love failure. So you know what? I may get it wrong right here with you today. And if that's the case, you can come on back. And so what I'm doing is I'm doing something very ethical and responsible is I'm saying, you can, um, you're, I need you to tell me that. Now, all bets are off if somebody's completely psychotic, just like all bets are off in terms of my autonomy if I happen to you know, be in a car accident and I need the paramedic to make decisions for me. But the default is not to distrust, except if you're a TSA agent. I suppose, but, but we've already talked about that. We're gonna, we're gonna change that too, right? Um, so, so how do you invest in this, um, this blue zone? We don't just do it with health promotion programs. We do it by having this idea that, that um, we wanna capture the moment of opportunity when anybody wants to work on their mental health, because then that's upstream, but you could also get the people in crisis. They get access too. Now, sometimes that disrupts it a little bit, and you have to kind of take a different tack, because when a crisis happens, all hands on deck, we have to, we have to uh, do some, we have to mobilize some other people. But it's a much more nimble and simple approach. We start simple, we assume people have capacities, and, but we, we put up front that we're gonna fail forward together, and if it isn't working, um, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll deal with it. So, okay, so there's yes buts, often. And, um, aren't there are big risks out there? Or are there? Um, now, why do we have a risk paradigm now in our society? It wasn't when I was growing up. Any, any of you that are older than 50 can probably uh, remember that uh, free-range parenting didn't have a label because that's what we all did. We all wandered around. And we all learned that talking to strangers is a great idea until, I don't know, 70s or something, and somehow that became dangerous. Stranger, I mean, the strangers I talked to um, since yesterday made my heart sing and my soul fly. Perfect strangers. Why do we tell people not to talk to strangers? You have a better chance of being abducted or dying in a terror attack um, than you do of, of winning any lottery. And, but yet we, we give all our energy some, with this myth that we can somehow prevent these things from happening. Guess what you can? By investing in the blue. By investing back in caring communities and supporting all of our partners to be kind. What we've done on campuses where we start, and we think we're doing best intentions. We teach staff and faculty to be our partners and to support. We give them mental health first aid training. What we've really done, we've told them to diagnose. We've, we've told them to look at where the problems are, and we've told them 
with the best intentions, the University of Michigan or whatever campus it is, we care for our students the best thing. Give them the Cadillac, send them to CAP, send them to counseling because we want the best care. Well, that would be like sending me for bariatric surgery because I'm carrying, what would you say, 30, 40 extra pounds? Maybe that's an exaggeration. When really there's some other things I could do about this. And, and if I was working with someone, they'd be really talented and they'd say, let's capture the moment of opportunity for Peter to lose weight. No, no, we're gonna send you for bariatric surgery because that's the best thing. Um, we do the best for everybody. You get instant, you know, really good results. So about this graph, so this, I just um, obviously estimated this by looking at some uh, data sources that showed these kinds of trends. Um, the suicide rate here, this is the Canada one. It's actually a bit outdated because um, it started to climb back up. And I know um, recently the CDC gave us something on, uh, before we go to the suicide one, I want to show you about, uh, talk about terrorism. So um, this is a complex slide. But terrorism before and after 9-11, a more dangerous world. An interesting article. And basically the thesis is, and the data here, are that terrorism peaked long before 9-11 and it started to decrease, and you had this blip. So we're actually not as, um, now, somebody might say, well, it's because we're doing so much of this surveillance. I really don't think so, but it could be. I don't know why, but the point is, um, don't panic. Um, there are bigger issues than uh, being afraid of people and war and suicide, and it's called uh, inequity and global warming. There are bigger issues than this stuff. Um, but let's look a little bit at the, at, the, at the suicide. So this is the CDC data, and it's sort of alarming. 1999, 2016, what did they say? 30% increase. Yikes. So what's that about? But then before we ask what that's about, let's look at the context. So it's, yeah, it's trending up, but look before. Why did they choose those dates? Did they want to tell a story? Did they you know, did want to get on CNN? I, you know. So yeah, we need to think about it, but look in context. We, but suicide's all about context in so many ways. So here's the one with Canada, and it started to de decrease a bit. Really, a, a, quite a peak in the 80s. I don't know what that was about. Probably economic would be my guess. And then in so the US data, look at the, uh, the risks in context here. So um, in this country, I think you refer to American Indians. Um, in Canada, we refer to them as indigenous peoples. And, and that's a problem. And why is that a problem? Because we've, in our colonization, we've ripped the heart and soul of their culture and their communities. Um, but then again, why are suicide rates less in, for Hispanics, Asians, and African Americans? Uh, hello, community, maybe, is there? So that's, that's natural investment in the blue. So we can throw all our fancy techniques, I hate to disappoint the students in the room, everything you're learning, basically, uh, you know, um, everything you're learning today will be good. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, uh, do I have another context one? Oh, so this is some Aboriginal or in Indigenous um, data in Canada. Very, very alarming. This, these are communities that have, um, uh, I think it's genocidal what has happened in terms of uh, what we've done um, to our first peoples. Uh, and uh, another one, uh, what I like about this, this slide is um, the researchers on suicide that have looked at the data that says risk, the risk prevention doesn't prevent any suicides, that screening doesn't prevent any suicides, they come up with this conclusion that it's inequities and poverty um, and, 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 and then this idea of we need to focus collectively on um, and, and culture, building, building that kind of culture to, uh, and sense of identity to, um, to, to, to deal with this. All right, let's go back. Sorry about that. And okay, so what's uh, what's this stepped care 2.0 thing about? How are we doing for time? We got uh, 10 or 15. Okay, so it's not a new concept, stepped care. This is uh, very big in Western Europe. Uh, you can see the British flag there, and my colleague uh, Jillian is a British. Uh, um, uh, origins and, and uh, they've done some as past 20, 25 years in the National Health Service. They, they basically built a system. So we talk about health system, talk about 
I don't know, do you talk about health system in the US? Is that a, is that a concept, health system? Yeah, okay. Well, guess what, there isn't one. There's no system. Uh, probably less so here than in other parts of the world. There's a corporate system. Um, in Canada, there's no health system. Publicly funded, but it's, it's decentralized. Every province has their separate one, and, and some are very disorganized. Uh, Ontario is a bit more like the U.S. system, but it does have an, uh, you know, universal health insurance. But our universal health insurance doesn't do a whole lot of good with um, the kind of stuff I'm talking about. Uh, the blue zone, um, it's very medically uh, physician and hospital oriented. So in the, in the UK, they wanted to do better, and step care goals in any model reduce the burden of mental illness in society. Uh, and the care system self-correct. So you can't really do that until you, until you define a system. And so the idea of steps is a beginning point or starting point to say, this is my system. Let me populate it. Or as Jillian says in her version at George Washington University, here's the buffet. And it can be circular, it doesn't have to be step oriented, but here's the buffet, and here are the expectations for everybody, um, both con consumers or partners or people that are delivering care. Here are the expectations and the responsibilities as you engage in these levels. And so it's really putting a map out there so that people can organize what they're already doing in a way that's kind of meaningful and allows self-correction and allows people to navigate easily. So I try to keep those principles um, at play when I'm teaching right now. So this idea of a PowerPoint that is, um, I'm not going to tell you this is the linear path that you're going to go through, this slide, then that slide. You can go in and explore, and you can choose what you're interested in. And so the UK model, um, we 2.0 differs from that, because the UK model is a bit more rigid. And I think a lot of people um, sometimes are afraid that step care means it's very prescriptive and there's no flexibility. Well, good news, 2.0 is different. So we still arrange programs along steps because we want people to see the context of decision making where there's costs in terms of time, there's costs in terms of our expectations that students will invest certain things or, or their time or their energy or be willing to be challenged. That's a cost or, or sometimes the cost is I'm gonna give up my autonomy. And, uh, and go to a intensive care. So it allows us to have those conversations that, that inform uh, what I call client-centric decision-making. So anybody want to take a stab at what the difference might be between client-centered and client-centric? Guess? That's, it's semantics, of course. But the way I, I like to think about it is, um, we all know client-centered is about um, one size doesn't fit all. And so we need to kind of uh, listen and connect and figure out what the unique solution is for this particular person. And we bring all the different resources and the different professionals in to kind of make sure that the right mix is happening. So that's what client-centric is with one more step. Sorry, excuse the language. I use that word step a bit uh, too much. Now, my, my partner uh, sometimes said, uh, yeah, you use it for everything. And my son, especially, he's a lawyer, works with the... Um, really disadvantaged uh, in legal aid um, uh, places. And he says, all this stuff you're talking about is for people with privilege, Peter, like the people that are down and out. I said, come on, no, I think we can fit them in this tent. So we're working on that. But um, uh, the, uh, where, oh, now I lost my train of thought. Where was I? Oh, centric. So <laughs> centric is um, the decision is made by the uh, client. And so uh, think about where health records I predict will be, and of course, really dangerous making predictions um, because they, they don't come true, but I'll take, it, I'll take a, a stab at it. So I predict that this is where the health record will be, and it'll be in my pocket as a, as a consumer of health services, and I'll go in to see one of you, and, and you'll say, Peter, can I have a look at your record? No, I just want to talk about this today. There's no need to do that. Or, yeah, sure, um, here's my record. And, uh, but then also it means that uh, the provider and the coach or the expert is a consultant for you, uh, which is, of course, in good medical care, we do this. Well, here are the options, here are the risks, and you, which do you want to do versus I'm going to decide for you. Uh, and we sometimes do that. In, I mean, in good care, in good therapy, we, in counseling, we do that. But we don't have a structure that really helps to remind us to keep to those uh, principles. And that's, that's what we're trying to do with this. So what is 2.0? collaborative system of delivering and monitoring recovery-oriented programs. 
So you're gonna have to go in here and find out where recovery, if you don't know what, what recovery principles are, and there's a little um, bullet or a, a tab, and, and when you press the back button to find out that, we don't have time for that. But different from UK is the recovery principles, is the responsibility and that centric piece, and this um, constant um, measurement, assessment, and monitoring, are we producing the most autonomy and resilience in our work? So think about um, trigger warnings and working with folks with trauma. If we're doing that work really well, um, we are keeping in mind that exposure is a really good treatment method, but uh, preparedness and readiness is key. Sometimes trigger warnings get um, misunderstood, and they're just an invitation to avoid the things that are going to be hard. Sometimes therapy is misunderstood as that too. Therapy isn't about coming in and curling up and having um, just, uh, um, what did uh, Carl Rogers call, unconditional uh, love and positive regard. I think Rogers actually challenged people. I think we've misunderstood Carl Rogers because what does love really mean? When you really love someone, you give tough love too. Are we giving enough tough love in our counseling work. I uh, sometimes hear from colleagues who are struggling with compassion fatigue. And this came out, um, so I, I'm hope, this is the invitation, I'm hoping for you to share some of your wisdom with me. When I was in um, St. Catharines yesterday, and I, sp I spoke with the administrative leaders, they said, compassion fatigue's a big thing. And I said, I, th I think the reason compassion fatigue is big is because um, the, we've sold this empathy thing too hard, and so, uh, really caring counselors get down in the weeds and they stay with the pain and they reflect the pain um, and they, they get caught just like the clients are the, with this deficit that I have this horrible thing that I'll never get and we recovery principles is focus shift the focus on yes you've had this horrible thing but like the cab drivers I had they, what, what I focused on with them is all the things they are doing despite that uh, disadvantage they have and at the end of the the cab rides, I mean, these guys, you know, they, 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 um, I think they wanted, we both wanted to be friends at, at the end, because I, I focused on the things that, that, are, that are positive. Uh, so the readiness uh, is also uh, much more important in this model than, uh, than symptom levels. We do pay attention to symptom levels, but we just don't make all our decisions on them. And then it's really flexible on modality. So there can be online programming, there can be in-person, like we've done in Newfoundland, you can, your entry point can be all of those. But that requires shifting the risk paradigm. Because people say, oh my God, well, if we do something at the entry point over the phone and we start offering care, what if it fails? Well, if you build into your expectations all along the way that guess what, this might fail and here's what you do, anybody that sues you, um, if you have this plan and this, uh, this rationale for how you're, how you're changing care well thought out like this, then I think uh, the chances of you losing a case are probably low. So, so, those, so the, the, a huge factor in people are transitioning to stepped care. When they start implementing, they come back to me and say, help me with the messaging. Help me with the marketing because that's big. It, and informed and treatment means that you message exactly what it is you're trying to do. And we need to do that because we're changing what we're doing. And so the expectations that people have coming in, particularly at um, elite institutions, uh, are going to be very different. And talk to Jillian if you want to find out how, how she shifted that conversation. Jillian, do you, can you just stand up? <laughs> so Jillian will be on the panel tomorrow morning, which is really just taking what we're doing today and, and continuing the conversation with the experiences that some campuses have had uh, here in the US. Okay, so this is a big one. Um, Solution-focused strengths-based interventions applied first. Now, I'm a psychodynamic therapist, uh, interpersonal therapist. I love, I'm very attachment-focused. I like working with people with borderline personality and bipolar disorder. Um, and so when I do, I do intensive therapy. I do traditional, what I call private practice therapy. I don't mean it in terms of getting money. But the idea that it's a 50-minute session and you kind of go on for a long time. I, I like doing that when I have a really good connection. When we implemented stepped care, there was room to actually do that because one size doesn't fit all. When you do single session work, the, the expectation is, and a lot of students like it, and in fact our community members say, oh, I, I don't want, I mean, it might be different from some elite populations where no, it's therapy, I'm not gonna do anything but therapy. But I can, at another time, maybe during the panel, I can tell you what, the conversation is when someone comes in and they say they want therapy and it's the only thing that keeps them alive. I've 
there's, there's a way to transition people uh, from that, uh, in, in a, to, to sell that in a way that uh, the people who thought they wanted therapy originally, um, there are other options that get them that kind of comfort of weekly uh, contact, um, but I won't go into that. So trial and error is very big, and sharing this idea that we can fail together. Traditional therapy, like I practice, is offered only to those who are really um, ready to engage in challenging work. Now, sometimes, um, you know, that's not one size fits all either. Sometimes we have to be very um, cognizant of the, how trust gets built. And when someone's traumatized and they're not trusting us, they may not be ready um, to uh, disclose the, the depth and the severity of the issues. And so this is not about being dismissive. So often what I say up front is I say, you know, quite often people, this is all about a relationship. So what I'm offering to you is a relationship. Um, and, and I, like your GP, I'm never going to fire you. Um, you can keep coming back to me. What, so today we're not going to go into a whole lot of stuff we're going to go to where you want to go. But you know what? You can come back at any time to go deeper. But that's not the default. I think the way we often operate is we got to go figure all those things out first. Then we have a diagnosis. And then we begin treatment. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. And so maybe the last thing I will share with you, and you can dig down and see all of these principles here, but is um, about the, um, the what is it that, that produces good outcomes? So what we measure is what we value. So a central component with um, a, a, a being self-corrective, having a system, and having a, a care model, and having counseling or therapy that's self-corrective, is you've got to have some kind of way of monitoring on a regular basis. And I'm going to get into those in a few moments. But what is it we're measuring? What is it that we know predicts outcome? So this is where uh, the students can you know, get angry and resentful, because everything that they're being taught, most of what they're being taught, man, being exaggerating, is techniques and assessment. Depends on the program. Um, so at most, that accounts for 15% of outcomes, is the technique we choose and the assessment that we do. And of that, uh, approximately 9% uh, is really about who you are as a person. And then the six, so really it's the 6% is techniques and assessment. So you're going to school, how much money are you paying to go to school? And, and, and you're learning all these techniques and assessment. Well, hopefully this is a point where you can make sure that you're attending to some other things that really predict outcome. And that you can help revolutionize the system so that we can harness and tap into these things that are really important for creating health and mental health. Some of it being in the blue zone and that graph that you saw. So some of it is not something we don't have control over. Extra therapeutic factors, patient circumstances, motivation, 40%. But we can adjust the context of our care supports so that we can pull on the unique, one size doesn't fit all, patient -centered characteristics, and we can tap into what are you ready to do, as opposed to we're going to get you ready to do what we want to do and what I'm trained to do. I'm trained to do CBT, and you got to, and John Norcross says, pretty much you got to be in the action phase to do CBT. So I'm just going to horse whisper you over to this, and I'm going to do that 50 minutes every week until you're ready to do CBT. But there's other ways to horse whisper. Get a horse. Seriously. Or, you know, there are people who are doing that, equine-assisted therapy. Or puppies. You know, or peers. Or, you know, there's all kinds of ways to help people get that connection. And as, if you're the kind of like the GP as the mental health person. You're, you're a bit of the navigator. You're, you're still building that relationship because you're saying, go get a horse and come back and tell me about it. And I'm, and, but I only spent 10 minutes with you because it, you know, it really doesn't take long to say, go get a horse. I don't have to spend 50, I don't have to know, okay, let's spend 50 minutes now. What else could we talk about? Um, get into this sort of habit of uh, sharing the decisions with, with clients about how much time they want to spend. We're amazed. Sometimes students say, uh, 15 minutes would be fine. You know, because spending more time with you, I kind of get really anxious. Or, um, you know, I'm really depressed. An hour? Ooh, I'm exhausted. So having these conversations quite openly and making, again, the decision is theirs. I never say no. Someone says, I want weekly psychotherapy. I don't say yes, necessarily, right at the beginning. But I don't say no. I say, come back next week. Um, I've got 30 minutes here. Let's talk about that some more. We'll test it out, see if, if it's going to be a good fit. Because we know the therapeutic alliance is huge. And so I have to like you. I can't like everybody. I have to connect with you. And, and if, if it's not fun for me, if I'm not curious, and my job is to be curious, and I'm trained now to be curious, like any scientist is, 
but sometimes it won't work. So we'll test that out and we'll see. Um, and, and it'll be a mutual decision. And, and then the big, one of the big factors, and this is what stepped care is all about, is that we, we have all kinds of options on this buffet. And we're going to help you by thinking of the dimensions that are important, like autonomy, resilience, empowerment, readiness, and how much you want to put into this, how much you're ready to invest. We're going to then pick the right uh, ingredients from the stepped care uh, model. And you don't have to have just one step. You can have something from a variety, but you're, you're basing the rationale of the investment on the readiness. And I don't just mean, this is not a, this is not a neoliberal exercise in offloading um, you know, employers for paying insurance or governments for paying for services onto the population because we don't want to pay for it anymore. What I say is the investment's going to keep, in, this is, there's, we need more money to do this, but we can also, not only will, we, will the more money be useful, but by reorganizing what we already have, we're going to produce much, much better outcomes. We know that monitoring, Scott, anyone who's followed Scott Filler, Miller, we know, and his colleagues, that regular monitoring, CCAPs, if you use that, use it every session, can, be very, can improve, out, improve outcomes. But only if you, in, in, if you implement it in a way that clients find engaging. Personally, and I've found the CCAPs isn't as engaging as some other tools. We, when we've used the BHM or the ORs and the SRS, our students love filling it out. But only if we bring it into the conversation and share it with them in every session, it becomes a therapeutic encounter. Uh, one last, I think, slide here. So anybody um, uh, read no John Norcross? few people have seen. So, so he uh, published probably about a decade ago uh, a text, uh, uh, Psychotherapy Relationships That Work. And he was uh, sort of on one side of the debate, this big psychotherapy debate about techniques and common factors. And so his idea was that evidence-based relationships are the most important thing uh, versus evidence-based treatments. And I take that, uh, um, uh, and, and, and he and, and some of his colleagues and Scott Miller take it a bit further to say, um, Evidence-based treatment is almost next to meaningless. What's really important is evidence-based practice. So if you're, if you're gonna set up a system of monitoring, it, it frees you up. Remember that, that risk paradigm um, book? Uh, it frees you up to do trial and error and experiment, experiment with clients because um, if it, we're gonna be monitoring this, it doesn't work, we're just gonna go kind of like I did in the customs office. Well, you know, this is an opportunity to try something different. So I didn't get through, but you know, I had this idea. Maybe I just show this letter and say that a whole bunch of Americans are going to be disappointed, and I can I can fail fail forward. So um, there's the Last Connections book. Anybody know David Barlow's work? This this little um, book down there, that color scheme with uh, uh, what is it? Therapy treatments that work. That brand is that familiar to any of you? Yeah. Okay. So. You know, no disrespect to David, because I, I love how he's failing forward. But I think he made a lot of money on uh, writing manuals for every diagnosis. Um, but it turns out that doesn't really matter, because y we don't need to diagnose. And he's now admitting that dis distress is distress. Whether you're depressed or anxious, the same treatment. Uh, love, caring, connection. Um, and if you want to build skills. So that's on, that's on the left. That's John Norcross, the love part, um, the relationships. And on the right is, oh, people probably want some skill development. And so the, um, the unified protocol is what he's come up with. And now he's making lots of money saying he was wrong, and this is probably a better way to go. <laughs> By the way, a disclaimer, I'm not making uh, any money, and probably uh, I, I, do, I, I may get a speaker's fee today, um, but I think um, there'll be a 30% withholding tax, and then all the things that I had to do in the interim but in struggling to cross the border, I'll probably be lucky to break even. So just, just put it out there, I'm not making a lot of money doing this. Um, the, I'm gonna end on what John Norcross said, uh, and I, when he, actually we paid him to come up to Canada, and I don't think it was an issue, that was many years ago. And he said in a, in a uh, full day workshop with us on relationships. He said there's three things you should do whenever you meet anybody, professionally um, or tend to, not necessarily ask these questions, particularly professionally. So you can have fancy monitoring systems or you can just remember to do this every time. How are you? But you know, genuinely, not just uh, how are you, you keep walking, but you know, when we're doing the care work, we really want to know. Um, how's this work going that we're doing? And how are we doing? 
And that taps into what we know predicts uh, uh, um, outcome. Uh, techniques are not independent of the relationship because I have to be passionate about what I'm doing for anyone to listen to me and to take me seriously and to feel hopeful and to maybe go and try that technique. If I do a good sales job, as David Barlow did on this, or as a therapist that really believes in CBT, it'll work. So you have to get back to what's your passion. So remember compassion fatigue. That happens when we stop using our passion, igniting our passion, bringing it into the room and leading with inspiration and being excited and having fun in this work. And that's for the most severely um, challenged people. If you walk in so consumed with their pain, now you don't want to be dismissive of, you want to connect, you have, that's an art, right? How do you say, I, I'm here, empathy is really important. But I, I think of the concept of, I don't know if anyone's coined this term before me, but flash empathy. Sometimes empathy is a split second, something very, very powerful and doesn't need 15 sessions of um, uh, active listening. So think about that. How do you do this flash empathy and then get going and get going with inspiration and excitement and inspire people? And if I've done anything today, it's inspired you to start thinking a bit differently and that there's lots of reason for hope and that you might join our growing community of practice um, uh, through uh, engaging with this model. Uh, so there are webinars uh, every month and, um, and there are ways to put in your input, your objections, your comments on, on a blog. Um, you, and I do review them because that's just the way the blog's set up. If I was really taking a risk, I'd say, yeah, just, um, but I don't know how to set that web page up. Maybe I can ask the technical people so that it's just a free flowing. I think I've said enough, thank you.